Chapter 1. Go back for a second, remind ourselves that there is this economic problem, and the economic problem is scarcity. We have unlimited wants, limited resources, that creates scarcity. We have to make choices. And we learned about rationality and incentives and on the margin. What's next? All of these ideas result in consequences. One of the economic consequences of the fact that we have to make choices is there are trade-offs. When we make a choice, we very often force a different outcome somewhere else. And, for example, we had, for a while, we were big on, as a nation, we were big on cutting carbon emissions. So we're trying to cut carbon emissions. We put all kinds of rules on the coal mining industry to try to enhance carbon. The trade-off for that is that there's less coal used. That means there's less coal mined. That means that coal miners lose their jobs. So there's a trade-off. We get cleaner air. We get fewer jobs in the coal mining industry. We get a new administration in. They abandon the climate change rules. They try to create, recreate the jobs in the coal mine industry. It turns out that they didn't manage to do that. There were a record number of coal mines that went bankrupt after the change because we can't act unilaterally. The rest of the world has to decide that they don't want to either. And since they're using less coal, the demand for coal is still falling. There's still a problem. So now we have a different trade-off that we traded worse climate, more use of fossil fuels, for well, a few jobs, but not very many, maybe. Okay, We do the same thing all the time with, you know, we're building a pipeline and it's going across a river, or what happens if it breaks in the river? There's always a trade-off, right? You drive your car faster, you have to use more gasoline when you do that. If you drive your car slow, people get mad at you for driving your car too slow. There's always a trade-off. The cute economist phrase that goes with this is there's no such thing as a free lunch. Some people put an ain't in there, so they say there ain't no such thing as a free lunch because that gives them a vowel, and then they say ten stoffel, which is there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. We had a professor here whose license plate was T-A-N-F-L, there ain't no free lunch. There's no free lunches. When someone says to you, we're going to make college free, well, two things. One is one is that it's not free. It's still going to take time. It's still going to take other costs from you, other money. And we'll talk about that in a second more when we get to opportunity cost. But it's not free to you. It might be zero price, as we economists say, but it's not free. It still has costs. And then out there, somebody else has to pay for it. And if it's the working people who are paying for college, pretty soon you're going to be out of college and you're going to be a working person, and now you're going to be paying for other people's college. So there's no such thing as a free lunch. Everything always has costs and consequences. Okay, so big lesson number one was nothing's free, right? Big lesson number two is that the cost we should consider is not how much we paid in cash for something. The cost of when we make a choice is what economists call an opportunity cost. If you are out camping and you head for the campground or you decide to go off into the woods on your own, you give up the other one. So if you head to the campground, you give up the joy of laying out in the woods all by yourselves. If you head out into the woods, there, you know, the, there isn't a restroom nearby and there's trees and stuff. Okay? Whatever choice you make, you give something else up. So if you choose to go to college full time, maybe you have to give up some work. You certainly have to give up your time. You m might have a better job that you, than you got while you're going through school. So maybe you're going through school 
you figure it out or you have a part-time job or you have a side gig that's helping you with school but if you hadn't gone to school you'd be working full-time somewhere you might be earning less money so the opportunity cost of going to school is everything that you give up by going to school it's not just the cost of the tuition and fees so if there are no tuition and fees that does not make school free it changes the opportunity cost but does not make it free okay if you go to Disneyland you pay to get in once you get in the rides are not free you have to stand in line you have to spend time to get on the rides it limits how many rides you have right not the money cost you have to pay because it doesn't cost you money to get on that ride it costs you time in the old days at Disneyland you actually paid per ride the lines were a lot shorter because you were paying for each ride and what did Disneyland do well they changed how you pay for things it used to be you paid individually by the ride which means if you were cheap you could ride a couple of rides that you really liked and not pay a lot of money to actually go to Disneyland now you go into Disneyland you pay a lot of money to get in you pay you know five thousand dollars a day to get into Disneyland and once you're in there there's not additional fees for getting on the rides but there's a time cost so if you want to ride the popular rides it takes more time and you can do fewer of them during the day if you love the canoe ride nobody's ever on that ride you can ride the canoe thing all day long you can ride that over and over and over and over and over again okay the popular rides the more fun rides the rides that you enjoy are going to be more expensive they're going to have a higher cost whether that cost is in money or in time or in whatever there's always a cost it what you gave up when you made that choice choose this person over here to go out with you gave up the chance to take this person okay you have two tickets to a concert one person you get to pick everybody else whoever else you could have gone with you lost that opportunity we can extend this to the whole economy we can look at these questions of choice and consequence and opportunity cost and all of these things in the context of a whole country and we do that by asking what we call the three basic economic questions the three economic questions every country has to answer the same three questions countries have different answers for these questions but the same three questions the answers by the way are all the isms so capitalism socialism feudalism there's a ism there it might be an answer to the three questions so the first one is what are we going to produce then how will it be produced and then who gets it for whom is traditionally how we answer that question so are we going to make televisions in the US or not if we are are we going to make them in automated factories or we're going to use a lot of people how are we going to make them and then who gets the money from all of that work how do we decide what to produce when our system mostly we decide through the use of markets and prices if it costs us thirty dollars a barrel to produce oil in the United States which is about what it costs us and if the price of oil in the world goes to twenty dollars a barrel that's a hint to us that maybe we shouldn't be in the oil business if it costs us thirty to make it and twenty to sell it that's a sign there's other things that we might have made in the past CDs we used to make CDs in the United States compact discs nobody wants to buy those anymore and so we might stop making them because yeah the market is telling us there's no demand for these things there's no interest in these things 
Okay. Sometimes the decision of what to produce is made by the government one way or another. If you want to start up a business and call it Murder Incorporated and say, put up a sign and go, hey, 50 bucks, I'll break somebody's leg. 200 bucks, I'll break both legs. You know, $2,000, well, f the government might stop you from doing that. Right? So the government is going to either encourage things or stop some things, and the government produces some things directly, right? The government buys ships and planes and builds buildings and has courthouses and jails and all this stuff. So the government is deciding some of what we produce. Hidden behind all this, of course, is the idea that we have limited resources. So as a country, we have to decide the best way to use those resources. And it might have been that in the 50s, the best way to use those resources was to build televisions because those were the cool new things. And over time, televisions become cheap commodity things and maybe we don't make those in the United States anymore. Maybe we get into biotech and maybe we get into computer software and maybe we get into things that are more advanced and create better jobs and are new and exciting and innovative. But either way, we have a limited set of resources and we have to decide the best way to use them. Once we've decided what we're going to produce, then the question becomes how to produce it. And again, we haven't really dug into the different kinds of resources and the different options we have, but a country like the United States where workers are generally fairly well paid, businesses may try to not use a lot of them. If you go into a U.S. car factory, there's a lot of things that are done by robots and machines all over the place. If you go into a car factory in some other parts of the world, you're going to find a lot more people and a lot less machines. It's true for agriculture. In the U.S., your picture of a farmer is a guy with a big combine, and he's in this air-conditioned combine, and he's taking care of a 1,000 acres by himself. In many parts of the world, what you have is handheld tools, and you have lots and lots and lots of people spread out across the farm. Okay? So how we use our resources is determined by the price of those resources, just like the price of everything else. How we produce is going to be different in each country based on the resources that country has and the prices of those resources. Again, we have to make choices, not just as individuals, but essentially on a country level. And we'll talk about a little more how those choices get made here in a minute. The first two things, the what and the how, are all about the allocation of our resources. Allocation of resources. The third question is about the distribution of income. Who gets what out of this? How does your society figure out rich and poor and middle? In our country, and again, we'll talk about our system more here in a minute, but in our country, most of those decisions get made in the marketplace. They get made because some things are scarce. Some people are scarce. The things that a Steph Curry can do are scarce. There aren't many people who have that skill set that he has, what we call the human capital. Because his skills are scarce, he gets paid a lot. You may think that a school teacher is more valuable to society than a basketball player, but there's far more people who can be good school teachers than there are people who can be good basketball players. So the market's going to make a choice, and it's going to make that choice based on scarcity, the same as it does with what's the price of a potato or the price of a ear of corn or the price of getting your hair cut. What's scarce? Scarcity and prices regulate the system. Okay, So people who have scarce skills and abilities, and this is a lesson to you as you come out of college, are you coming out of college with skills and abilities that 100,000 other people are graduating with on the same day you are across America? Or do you have some unique skill set where you can do this and you can speak Chinese and you can speak Japanese and... Yes, you can do advanced statistics and you can do big data. What is it that makes you scarce 
so that someone is willing to pay you a lot. Okay? Part of this is tied up in incentives. Jobs that pay well, that's an incentive for people to try to pursue those jobs. Lots of people want to be doctors because they like being doctors, but doctors also get paid really well. Okay? And then, of course, the government plays a role in this. The government taxes us on our income. The government does things like says, this is the minimum you can pay a worker who works in your factory. You have to pay them this. Okay? And the government employs lots of people. And so the government is setting wages in some industries because the private sector is competing against the government for those workers. So this who question is the same as the other questions, except it's distribution of income, not allocation of resources. It's about markets and scarcity and prices. 